Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is on my imaging breakthroughs. And uh, it's not just gonna be about my imaging breakthroughs. I'm gonna pass it around the room and people can talk about what things they've done that really had them break through or uh, created a breakthrough or something that uh, they really noticed an improvement in their work immediately after trying, immediately after doing, immediately after buying. Uh, it could be new process, new processing techniques. It could be um, new equipment. Uh, it could be a number of things. And you'll see from my presentation, but uh, maybe we'll share. And uh, anybody out there that has any specific ideas is welcome to share that in text uh, in the chat. Um, but before we move on to that, uh, we have in the room Tolga, who uh, is our Image of the Week winner, and as well is going to be one of our first uh, um, vendor spotlights. Uh, Tolga is a new vendor of a number of different products, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand the room over to him. I'm going to pull up a gym, his Image of the Week so we can speak about that for a few minutes, and then talk a little bit about what he's selling and uh, what sets him apart from some of the other vendors out there. Uh, Tolga, if you're in the room, the room is yours. And I am not hearing you. I don't know if you're talking yet. There you go. Now you're unmuted. Oh, I still don't hear you. I just heard you five minutes ago, too. Huh. I see your lips moving. I even see your uh, dial jumping. Cannot hear you yet. Okay, okay. If you get that figured out, uh, come on back to me, and I will, uh, maybe I'll hand it over to you at the end of the session. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is I am going to, even though you probably saw it last week, I'm going to share uh, Tolga's image, which one image of the week. Please stop me if you cannot see it, but this is the uh, Elephant Trunk Nebula. Um, really nice work. Uh, and uh, like I said earlier, if you are, I don't know if we can hear you in a little bit, we'll give you the, we'll give you the room. Um, I just want to do that so I can see my screen. I am going to jump over to my presentation. And um, if you guys cannot see my uh, presentation, please stop me. Um, you know, I just want to make sure. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Just someone chime in and let me know. Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. perfect. Want to make sure it wasn't something on my end that we couldn't hear Tolga. Um, okay, so my imaging breakthroughs. Well, first I tried, and uh, I basically bought a DSLR and I pointed it up to the sky. Honestly, I just put it, I rested it on top of a table and pointed it up to the sky. Thirty second exposure, sixteen hundred ISO, and click. Uh, and I saw lots of stars, and I knew that uh, as people were telling me, you can use a DSLR to photograph deep sky objects. Um, but I had to try, and that's the point. So uh, there were a number of things that I tried. Uh, but then I, I started paying attention to what people were telling me, and I got a T-ring and a T-adapter, and I ended up hooking up to my telescope, which at the time was a CPC-800. Um, Adam, do you have your window selected? Uh, someone's saying they can't see yours your screen they see someone else aha uh -huh. that's okay there you go thank you David now you should be able to see me and stop me if you can um, yes so I hooked it up to the CPC 800 up not the best equipment to uh, use for imaging but uh, enough to let me just test out what I was doing and to play around and I'll, I'll be honest just that little bit of playing around I had a lot of fun I would take an image at the time, probably of, uh, let me think about that, Saturn, and I was impressed. I was more than impressed, I was hooked. And basically that's what got me into all of this. My first imaging breakthrough though, was to realize I was kind of doing it all wrong. Um, I started off, as I said, with a CPC 800 in alt as mode, and you can see there, uh, that's the CPC 800. And for those of you who've been imaging for a while, you'll know uh, not the 
best way to do it? Well, for maybe for planetary, you could use an Altaz, but for deep sky, well, it is a big limiting factor. So within a few months of, uh, probably a few weeks of my first try, I ended up buying a Celestron wedge. And that is my wedge down on the bottom there. You can see it. Um, that's one of Celestron's, I think it's their second wedge that they put out. Um, and while it worked, uh, it had uh, some quirks. Uh, it was very difficult to polar align. Um, why was it difficult to polar align? Well, the uh, left and right motion or the um, east to west motion of it um, was very rough. I had to loosen the mount. I had to loosen the wedge to be able to adjust it. And it was just really impossible to adjust in fine steps. And when you're drift aligning, something that I would find that I'd have to do, um, it gets really difficult to set it up. So eventually, uh, I got a better wedge, but I had to wait for Celestron to introduce it. And this was uh, a good two years after I uh, started imaging. So that better wedge came out, and I bought it, and it did pretty well. Uh, the, the adjustment issues were kind of gone. Uh, it was a lot more rigid. Um, and I immediately realized, okay, it does get better. And that was one of my imaging breakthroughs was, was to realize that uh, you really are at the mercy of your equipment. And a rigid setup is a lot better than a setup that is semi-rigid, kind of may work well enough, but uh, you soon discover that what you had wasn't really good enough. One of the other breakthroughs I had was stacking. You know, first you hook your camera up and you point to a globular cluster and you take a 30 second exposure. And um, the you look at the camera, you look at the back of the camera and hey, you've got a globular cluster in there. You pull it up on the screen and you see that you've got a lot of noise in there. So stacking became uh, one of the necessary things. And I learned a bit about stacking uh, I first used Deep Sky Stacker, and it's a great free program, but as I continued to try doing what I was doing, I realized it, would all, it all came down to how many uh, exposures you were using, or more accurately, the overall length of your imaging time. So I started by combining a few subs, 10 by 30 second subs. Then I tried 50 by 30 second subs. Well. Then, after I got that wedge thing worked out, and I got my auto-guiding worked out, um, I started combining a lot of long subs. So I, I would try combining 30 by 5 minute subs. And my overall integration time started rising. And that became one of the keys. That was my breakthrough, is that overall imaging time is one of the most important things. Building on that, uh, the nebula season came around, and I ended up sending my DSLR out to Gary Honus, and he did the H-Alpha mod for me. And You can do this in your uh, own home if you, I don't know, if you uh, are proficient at taking things apart and, more importantly, putting them back together. But I was very intimidated. I watched his video on modifying your... Uh, on doing the H-Alpha mod on your camera. Actually, it wasn't a video. It was a, uh, a website, a web page. And I read uh, page one, and I said, hey, that doesn't look so tough. I could do that. Then I read page two and page three and page four and page five and page six and page seven and page eight. And I said, yeah, I think it's a bargain to send this out to have someone else do it. But I got my camera modified, and then the next thing I know, I was taking – pictures of nebula and the nebula was actually showing. I didn't have to stretch out this noisy mess to really get any visible nebula. And uh, my first shot was North American nebula and really impressed myself. Calibration frames were one of my next breakthroughs. Um, well, I, I was taking darks and bias because they're easy, uh, but flats were the big difficult thing that I had to get by. And without flats, it becomes very difficult to process your images without getting dark bands in the sides. You end up having different signal to noise ratios uh, in the center and the sides. Uh, the light fall off makes a big uh, difference, uh, especially if you're 
inherent field isn't flat, and with my CPC 800 using the old reducer, it wasn't flat, and it was, um, I had a ton of light fall off in the sides. But when I finally got that all working, it really made a big difference and improved my images considerably. Eventually, um, what I realized was, um, and I actually looked back to, uh, I looked back at some of my older posts on Cloudy Nights, um, and I think I was looking back to like 2009, and I was reading and I mentioned that um, I was imaging for a few hours and then it got cold outside, so I decided to break down and come inside. And I forgot that I used to sit out there with my equipment for all this stuff. Uh, that was a long time ago because shortly after I started uh, taking this stuff seriously, I realized that I had to automate a bit. I got Backyard EOS, EOS and I started automating my exposures. So what I would end up doing then is plugging into this nifty program, uh, take 30 exposures at, uh, of this duration, at this ISO, and uh, call me in the morning. Um, so I basically was able to image for four or five hours. Um, Backyard EOS didn't flip the meridian for me. Um, well, I shouldn't even say that. With a CPC 800 wedge mounted, you don't have to flip on the meridian. So that wasn't an issue back then. Uh, but uh, it has some limitations. So while it would do my, while it would take my exposures, and I could use the integration with Astro Tortilla to do my framing, um, it didn't do focusing. It wouldn't allow me to reframe on a new object, and it wouldn't park my telescope. So eventually, shortly after uh, another upgrade, I did. Uh, I upgraded to Sequence Generator Pro. And then I had full automation. Everything from taking my exposures to framing to focusing to reframing to parking. So I was able to get multiple image, uh, multiple targets in on one night. And that really benefited me in a, in a huge way because all of a sudden I wasn't just um, able to take long, uh, lots and lots of long subs. I was also able to maximize the time that I was taking and automate the routine of taking the same target over multiple nights. So I would go from, I honestly went from two to three hours on average per target to about eight hours per target. And the difference is huge. You're opening up a whole new world of targets to yourself and making it a lot easier. Uh, the framing became a piece of cake. And that was actually one of the biggest struggles I had. Um, you know, you can frame manually, but it takes you 15 to 20 minutes. This does it in a minute. And uh, that was a giant leap forward for me. But one of my biggest um, one of my biggest upgrades, and I honestly, I heard people say, oh yeah, an astrophysics mount, uh, they're worry-free, you're, you're going to have it, you're, it's going to disappear underneath your telescope, you're going to just love it. Uh, I heard people saying that, and I, I, I drank the Kool-Aid, I bought it, but what I didn't realize was that I would go from throwing away a lot of subs because the stars were elongated to having issues with um, periodic error to all sorts of different things that can pop in, all sorts of different things that could pop up. It also improved the pinpointedness of my stars. I started taking really, really good subs and it surprised me. It, it, allowed me to step up my game, but also it allowed me to see how much of a limiting factor my non-imaging specific mount was. And when I bought the Mach 1, I had to get rid of the 
uh, CPC 800 telescope because it's integrated into the mount. And I ended up getting an Edge HD 800, which helped further those pinpoint stars. And in fact, it expanded them to the corners. Um, I was also using a um, William Optics Zenith star, which was a doublet. And when I shortly after getting the Mach 1, I upgraded to the, um, or I, I, I'm getting my timeline a little bit wrong here. Um, a little while after that, I got the Low Star, the William Optic Star 71, and uh, that uh, additionally helped keep me keep my stars pinpoint. Got rid of my chromatic aberration that was showing up. Um, was a bit faster, and more importantly, was able to hold this new camera that I was planning on getting. And there it is, the new camera. So I ended up buying a cooled mono CCD. And I did actually buy this camera before I got the William Optic Star 71 because when I put it on my Zenith Star, uh, it ended up basically sagging the focuser about an inch. Yes, an inch. Uh, my focuser could not hold it. Uh, basically, the tube just looked like it wanted to open right up and let that thing fall right out. And I tried using it for a little while, but it was not going to work. It ended up, um, uh, well, you can imagine, it's sagging an inch. It basically didn't work. Um, and the cooled mono really had a number of benefits. Better sensitivity in all wavelengths because I'm all of a sudden shooting with filters. And instead of losing a lot of those pixels that you get in a one-shot color, uh, I was taking advantage of the whole camera. And the noise was better distributed, and the um, the uh, wells were actually deeper. So I was able to take longer exposures. The noise was more random. I was able to get much, much better pictures. I, of all the upgrades I did, this one surprised me the most. I told I told you the mount surprised me, but. When I got the Mono CCD, I said to myself, you know, if I was using this camera a lot earlier, then I'd probably have a lot better images. In RGB, by taking channel at a time, you just get much better signal to noise ratio, even if you're taking shorter exposures. The filters, even the RGB filters, helped to cut out a lot of the light pollution. Um, the other thing, that I had been trying with my DSLR, and I knew it was helping me, but uh, didn't quite have the same benefit were narrowband filters. And with my DSLR, you know, narrowband filters are nice, specifically H-alpha filters. Um, it helps you cut through the light pollution, and it gives you, um, it, it allows you to pull out some of that H-alpha nebula if your camera's modified. But with a mono, it's a whole new world. Um, the, you obviously get the light pollution advantage that narrowband filters give you, but, um, the mono is just much more sensitive in that H alpha wavelength. You're throwing away, a, you're reflecting away a lot of that H alpha when you're using a one shot color. When you're using these, mo uh, a mono camera, you just suck up the H alpha and it really makes it pop. And it, a uh, the, the well depth allows you to take very long exposures. And long exposures mean high signal to noise ratio. Um, you're basically, with a cooled mono CCD, uh, you're cooling it to the point where dark current isn't an issue. The narrowband filters are preventing the light pollution from being an issue. All of a sudden, your only issue, your only noise issue is read noise and read noise is pretty inconsequential until you're trying to reveal the dimmest 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 object or i should say the dimmest 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 part of the dimmest objects out there uh if you're not read noise limited you can sh show a lot or even when you're re read noise limited uh you get a really nice image um i will say my first subs with this, I was jumping up and down. I was as 
excited about my first few cells with my, mon my narrow band cells with my mono camera as I was taking that image of Saturn with my DSLR. Um, and basically, every one of these uh, breakthroughs I had, you know, we're all excited about astronomy, but it just, it really shook me. And I got, I don't know, I would jump up and down. I would run inside to show my wife something. She'd be like, yeah. And uh, I would be like, no, 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 but look. She's like, yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. This stuff gets me, uh, gets me psyched. So like I said, the, the mono CCD allowed me to take very long exposures. The deeper well, the RGB uh, allowed the deeper, uh, the RGB in combination with the deeper well allowed me to just pull in a lot more signal over time. And with that lower noise, that's a higher signal to noise ratio. The channel at a time really Im improved sensitivity. But while that happened, it did require me to learn some new processing techniques. Uh, like I already said, narrow band, it's much more sensitive and lower read noise, which allows you to reveal some of that dimmer stuff. Uh, lower read noise than my DSLR, of course. Um, but yeah, that what I had to do was I had to learn an, entire new, an entirely new processing technique when I got the mono camera. So I decided to buy Pix Insight. Um, once you have your images, processing is almost everything. Uh, but Pix Insight, um, coming from Deep Sky Stacker, I was immediately impressed with the quality of the pre-processing. Um, I told this story before, but uh, I got Pix Insight, and like most people, I thought it was complex. I just had no idea what was going on, and I was manually uh, calibrating and stacking my images, and I. Finally, well, I was confused. So first I wanted to see how this camera worked. And I stacked my images with Deep Sky Stacker. And then I combined the um, subs and I looked at it. Now I was impressed with my work. But then I kind of slogged my way through Pix Insight, manual calibration, um, darks, flats, manually the first time. Man, that's tough. And I finally got through it and looked at my results, and it was a lot better than what Deep Sky Stacker did. And I knew what I was doing in Deep Sky Stacker. So all of a sudden, I said, hey, Pix Insight, they're onto something. Very shortly after that, I discovered pre processing script, which for a beginner is like a godsend. Um, all I have to do is, well, it's basically Deep Sky Stacker with the benefits of Pix Insight. And uh, plugged my images into there, registered them all on the same image, which made it so much easier. And then uh, clicked Stack, and 20 minutes later, it spit out these surprisingly good images. Um, I committed to uh, learning more about Deep, uh, excuse me, about Pix Insight. And little by little, I learned the tools, um, color calibration, which uh, with Photoshop to me was a little bit more seat of the pants. With Pix Insight, it became a lot more of a specific routine. DBE, um, dynamic background extraction, which is basically gradient removal or vignetting removal. Um, it... Uh, basically immediately improved my images. I was using Gradient Exterminator in Photoshop, but I would end up having to use that later in the process. And uh, DBE allowed me to use it early in the process and fix my images right off the bat so I knew exactly what I wanted to do with them and continue on. Um, it works in linear. So before I went nonlinear, I could use, I could do my gradient, re um, gradient removal. And uh, that combined with the screen transfer function, I immediately knew what I had, and I immediately had that vision for what I wanted the image to look like, and I was able to go ahead and work on noise reduction, which again took a commitment, a commitment of learning. There are um, a number of different noise reduction tools in Pix Insight. At the time, I saw videos on Atris wavelets, 
uh, ACDNR, TGVD noise. And I picked ACDNR because it seemed the most um, user friendly to me. And to this day, despite occasionally having better luck with TGVD noise, uh, I still, when I want to really know exactly what I'm doing, I still go back to ACDNR and use it to do a lot of my noise reduction. And it definitely helps out. Histogram transformation. Um, it immediately became a better way for me to transform my histogram. Now, I was able to, at first, take my screen transfer function and send it over to the histogram, which uh, is not the best idea. Uh, but at first, it would work. Um, I was initially impressed with my results until shortly after I tried doing it more manually, which is basically uh, just means sliding and clicking OK. And that helped me out a lot. Wavelet-based sharpening or uh, wavelet-based, um, or I should say, uh, uh, the various histogram um, transformation tools in PixInsight took it to another level. The reason this PixInsight slide gets so much attention is because processing is almost everything. Uh, if you have round stars and a long exposure, then processing, you can do anything in uh, anything with it. And it's just a matter of how well you know your tools. And PixInsight is one of those tools where once you start working on it and start learning the, the, the toolbox, then you can really improve your images. Um, you can help execute your vision of what you see the image looking like. And most recently, my most recent upgrade uh, is what I'll call, call the big and fast upgrade. I had gone from a big and slow telescope, a uh, Edge 800 HD, uh, to an AstroTech 10-inch RC. And I've been asked why your field of views are so similar. What? benefit are you getting out of this? And I'll tell you, right off the bat, I knew what benefit I wanted to get out of this. I wanted to use this with a reducer that allowed me to get the same field of view as my edge, but speed it up two to four times as fast, or even faster than that. And I did. And all of a sudden, I uh, am shooting at f6, or excuse me, f5.6, with the same field of view that I was getting out of my edge at f8. So my uh, signal is basically doubled in the same amount of time. Um, my motivation for this was um, I would want to shoot a target and I would commit, I'd want to commit to getting 18 or so hours in on the target. And I don't know. Uh, in the summertime, that's three days, maybe four days. If the target isn't in the perfect position, maybe it's more days than that. If I wanted to do a mosaic, well, then that's eight days. Well, if you've ever been to Pennsylvania, eight days is basically, uh, eight clear nights, I should say, is basically three months, two, three months. So this really helped me speed up my, my game. And, uh, Speed just allowed me to get more more signal in less time, and that's what it came down to. And I, I, I feel like this upgrade really, um, whereas the mount, I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into. The CCD camera, I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into. With this one, I really knew what I wanted to get out of it, what I should be getting out of it, and what I expected to get out of it. And when I did the upgrade, I immediately got the results I was expecting out of it, and I've, I've been very happy with it. Um, and I, this is my the end slide, but one thing I do want to say is um, there are a couple breakthroughs that I did have that I didn't list in this. Um, I didn't list in this uh, presentation, or actually, I had a slide that only had two items in it, and I decided to pull it out last minute, but. The first would be finding my way over to Cloudy Nights. Um, I, I honestly can't remember whether I uh, made the error of, the, the error a lot of us have made, of buying my telescope, 
my first telescope, then going on cloudy nights and asking, hey, I'm, I bought this telescope. Is this good for imaging? Or whether I went on cloudy nights and said, hey, I'm thinking about buying this telescope. Will it be good for imaging? But I got so much good advice on cloudy nights that uh, it basically, without cloudy nights, I never would have gotten to where I am today uh, in, the, in the quality of my images, which um, I know a lot of you guys out there are putting out great quality images, but I am happy with my images these days which uh, in general makes my life a lot more, I don't know, uh, well, I guess I should say it makes me a lot more happy with my imaging life. And the other thing that happened was the Astro Imaging Channel. And uh, I know I did, you guys think I did this for you, but uh, no, I did this for me in a sense. Uh, the first Astro Imaging Channel was actually Hytham um, processing uh, Sergei's uh, Iris Nebula, and I wanted to see how he did it because uh, he did a great job with it and I wanted to see exactly what he did and I set up the room and um, basically um, I expected a couple people to come in and help just let me know whether, every, whether they could hear my voice whether they could see my screen and uh, basically six people popped in and then uh, it grew from there but that is uh, those are my major imaging breakthroughs and basically I just uh, I want to say uh, Thanks to everyone out there for watching because uh, I know you're watching, but uh, at the same time, you're also contributing. I see things pop up in the comments all the time, and I say, oh, that's a good idea. And that's really, uh, sharing our knowledge is really the best way to get better. And a number of those breakthroughs are, uh, a number of my imaging breakthroughs are kind of hard to pin down, but they probably did come from comments or presentations. Uh, and I can't even name all the people. I have a few people in mind, but I can't even name all the people who've kind of helped me with stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that's basically my presentation. Um, I did want to keep it short tonight because I am still fighting this sickness that's driving me nuts. Um, but uh, anyone out there, can you think of any imaging breakthroughs you've had? that uh, basically uh, brought your imaging to a next level that other people might benefit from, that, um, that uh, sorry, just reading the comments really quick. Anyone out there is welcome to contribute. Okay, I'm just reading. I guess they uh, initially had trouble seeing me, but now they can see it. Uh, I should point out. Well, I should. I don't have to say this stuff anymore. Now that we've got, uh, now that we've got chat, you guys can read that. So yeah, if you're in HD mode, you uh, you get to see my pretty mug uh, a lot more clear. Um, this particular presentation probably didn't need to be in HD, but uh, either way, um, yeah, Grant, uh, autofocusing is big, and I, I agree with that. Um, my uh, I thought, uh, Botanov mask, right? You focus, and you've got perfect focus. Well, autofocusing actually has uh, gone a little bit better than the Botanov mask could, and I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I always figured if the diffraction spike was centered, then bam, you're in focus. But uh, maybe autofocus is just that much more accurate, and if you're making a proper V-curve, uh, it's able to determine it down to a tighter critical focus zone. And not only that, but uh, it can do it at 2 a.m. when you're asleep or when you've fallen asleep. Although I will say this, I was imaging last night and uh, I went to review it this morning and my last six subs are all out of focus. Something happened. And, um, uh, well, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, get the best final few images and I've got to figure out why. But I was planning on imaging tonight and I cannot do it tonight. My, uh, my sinuses are blowing up on me. Um, oh, Jeff, you're watching me in HD. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, that's, that's cool. HD, uh, uh, on fire TV stick. So big screen TV. Uh, it's interesting how you can, uh, watch this stuff. We're hoping to get a, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, not an RSS feed, but a podcast as well. We're hoping to convert these things to podcasts so we'll be able to, uh, well, I don't know, so you could listen to us uh, while you're jogging or driving in the car or doing whatever. Um, 
Renan is saying better polar alignment did it for him. And, uh, well, yes, I agree with that. Uh, nailing down drift alignment, uh, really went a far way, uh, a long way for me. Um, speaking of that, um, one thing I didn't point out, I, I didn't mention auto guiding. Um, auto guiding is a big step forward, but, uh, when PhD two came out and they included the drift align wizard, um, and a number of different features that I'm just going to say made it a lot more user friendly. Um, it was a big step forward for me. Um, Corey, yeah, uh, no breakthroughs, but I think you're going to, uh, what was I taking a pick of last night? Um, I'm assuming you're saying you're talking about last night. Uh, oh my goodness. What was I shooting last night? Uh, last night was the Little Dumbbell Nebula. Um, I forget the designation, and M I don't have... M76? M76, yes. Yes, and um, yeah, I'm about uh, halfway done with that. Um, the other night clouded up for me midway through, and last night I lost uh, my final six subs. Uh, so maybe one more night. Kind of appreciate the... Uh, earlier the the night's getting dark earlier at this time of year uh what in a few uh couple months we'll be uh back to uh i don't know when does it start getting dark at 5 p.m uh i like those nights um it's basically all i've got for the presentation tolga do we want to test out your uh see if we can hear you one more time we'll see if it started working for us um can you hear me I can hear you. Awesome. Okay. Great. So uh, I have a small little, um, I'll do my little uh, presentation first. Yep. Go right ahead. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So I didn't start from the beginning. Um, okay. So um, I started a company recently this year. I sell astro imaging products only, uh, and I do, I do it in a uh oh. Did we lose him again? Sounds like more technical difficulties. Yep, Tolga, I think we lost you again. Um. Well, we'll try and. Uh, <laughs> Tolga's always here, so he always knows he's invited to uh, come back. We'll try and get these sorted out. Um, I do, if we don't have much else, I think um, what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to end the session. I'm going to suggest that maybe Tolga will get you back next week, and then what we'll do is uh, cover that. We did not have an image of the week this week, so you could speak about that next week as well. Uh, but again, I do want to thank everyone for coming. I love this new chat feature. Uh, I'm going to try and get something going for next week. I hope I'm feeling better because I have, I don't know, I've been drained. I have gone to work every day for the last two weeks despite being sick. Everyone at work hates me because I got them all sick. Uh, but, uh, oh, my goodness, you guys know how what it's like. Uh, um, hopefully this is it for me. Both kids in school, they're bringing home germs like crazy. But again, I digress. Thank you for coming, and uh, we will see you all next week.